to the Provost Lecture Series talk by Vincent Payer. The talk is hosted by the Department of Ecology and Evolution and the Arthur Center jointly. Um, there will be a small reception right outside this room after the talk, so uh, a little more chance to ask questions and uh, discuss. Um, Dr. Payer received his Bachelor of Science in Mathematics and Computer Science from Tel Aviv University, and he also did his Master of Science and PhD in Computer Science from Tel Aviv University. Um, after a stint in the Army, he went to do a postdoc in genetics at the Weizmann Institute in the Hobo. And then he did a, a place with a lot of cats in the uh, And then a postdoc in medical and population genetics at the Broad Institute at Harvard and MIT. He accepted a position as assistant professor in computer science in Columbia University in 2006 and was promoted to associate professor in 2011. He has won many awards and prizes and trained a large number of undergraduate researchers, masters, and PhD, um, PhD awardees, and postdoctoral researchers. Dr. Payer has worked on a wide range of problems from evolutionary biology to basic genetics and genoma genomics particularly in human biology on um, the genetics and genomics of disease, including Crohn's and various cancers. Today, he will be speaking on sequencing the Ashkenazi Jewish genome, and I really like those dreidels. Please welcome them. Um, so, uh, first, thank you for hosting me here. I had a uh, great time meeting everybody, and it's, uh, am it's amazing to be out of the city and breathe some fresh air. Um, also, uh, thanks, Jessica, for the, uh, for the introduction. Um, and based on that, you all know that I'm a, a computer scientist and a geneticist, so it only leaves me to tell you what I'm not. Uh, I'm not a, a sociologist, nor, nor a historian, which is something that one always needs to point out when talking about Jewish genetics. So while there are lots of, uh, lots of debates and uh, discussions regarding what constitutes uh, the, the group of uh, Jewish people, the, uh, we're going to follow the pioneer uh, anthropologist and geneticist uh, Morris Fishberg uh, by uh, sticking to the uh, scientific standpoint and treating Ashkenazi Jews as an ethnic group. So uh, Fishberg, uh, at the time, uh, more than a century ago, uh, was the first to really systematically uh, look at health data in, uh, on Jews in New York City. And he found some specific characteristics. He had found that the Jews there, the Ashkenazi Jews uh, of uh, Eastern European origin, had uh, had seemed to, uh, to be less susceptible for uh, tuberculosis than uh, people living in the same neighborhoods. Um, on the other hand, he uh, found lots of childhood diseases that are uh, that are more common in the uh, in the Jewish population. Uh, at the time, and I think nowadays we're sort of closing a loop here when we uh, when we consider the success of the uh, screening programs to what we now know are um, uh, Mendelian diseases, Mendelian disorders that are caused by mutations that are uh, almost uh, specific to uh, to Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, here you have a number of cases. That's a huge thing. Uh, a number of uh, cases per year uh, over a few decades in the, uh, of Tysak's burst. It's a number that's been uh, dropping steadily. Um, so besides these rare disorders and very debilitating conditions uh, caused by rare mutations, uh, the Ashkenazi Jewish population is also uh, distinctive in, in the genetics of uh, complex 
diseases, diseases that are caused by uh, multiple causes and genes, um, and as well as environment. Um, people might have heard uh, about the BRCA1 and 2 genes that cause uh, breast and ovarian cancer. Mutations for these are more prevalent in, in Ashkenazi Jews, and, and of course, um, uh, people may call them the, the uh, Angelina Jolie gene. The, um, uh, and from that, we can move on to Parkinson's disease, where uh, Sergei Brin's gene uh, is highlighted uh, as, a, as, some, uh, as more frequent, uh, carrying a mutation that's more frequent in Ashkenazi Jews than uh, almost anywhere else, uh, as well as other genes for Parkinson's disease and, uh, and Crohn's disease. Um, the, um, um, the reason that um, we might expect a specific population to have this kind of burden of, uh, of mutations has to do with history, or at least uh, has a plausible explanation in the history of populations. And when you think about it, if you have uh, the, the, the population as a whole uh, with a small isolated population, it might uh, migrate off it or just be separated somehow, then um, those isolated population on the populations on one hand pose a challenge because they would have or they would harbor uh, variants that are not seen elsewhere because the mutations that had uh, caused these variants had originated uh, along this population, uh, not in the larger group. It also, it, it's hard to, for a fast geneticist to draw inferences about the variation in those, those populations because a lot of genetic research is based on correlation patterns between, uh, between mutations, between gene variants, and the correlation patterns we see in the general pop population may not hold, and may not transfer to that isolated uh, uh, group. But uh, no, challenge, no challenge comes without uh, an opportunity, and the, uh, these variants that occurred here in this isolated population are a, another shot at goal, if you will, for us to learn new things about diseases, uh, and those are, those are sources of variation that have not been tapped by considering the general population, so uh, we very much would like to study them. Also, because of this bottleneck effect, uh, a small group of individuals uh, that had had been moved away from the, uh, from the general population. And the variation here is finite, so we have a shot at having a catalog of all variation in a, in a specific group, something that is much harder to do in a larger population. Um, how does this, uh, how, does he, how do these abstract principle, principles translate to the Ashkenazi population? Well. Uh, what do we know? What, so what we know in terms of the uh, textbook history is that uh, Ashkenazi Jews are named after the Rhine, uh, the Rhine Valley in Germany, um, where they are documented about uh, at about uh, a thousand years ago, um, as one of many communities of uh, of many Jewish communities in Western Europe that appeared after the, uh, the fall of the uh, Roman Empire. And um, through, the, uh, through the Middle Ages, uh, these communities are spread all over Western Europe. Um, and we see documentation uh, of the uh, relationship with, uh, with the authorities and with the church going sour. Uh, and then uh, at the late Middle uh, medieval times, and we see a series of expulsions from Western Europe, and we see so communities emerge as if from scratch uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, during modern times, this Eastern European Jewish population 
that used to be a very small minority of, uh, of world jury had grown and, beca uh, and became the vast majority of, uh, of Jews at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. Uh, and besides that expansion, uh, at least it was hypothesized to have stayed isolated um, in, uh, genetically and, uh, and culturally. So the, um, the big questions that I want to talk about today is, first of all, uh, can we quantify the extent of the bottleneck uh, generating the Ashkenazi population? Can we say how severe that bottleneck had been? And more practically, can we use that and improve our understanding of uh, of uh, genetics and the the way we deal with the population in terms of personalized medicine. Um, besides that, it would be also helpful if we if, if we gain some insight on this community that sort of emerged in Eastern Europe without uh, uh, without massive documentation of hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, moving from one place to another. So uh, if we can find out who are the Ashkenazi Jews, um, or at least weigh in on that, that would be great. So what's been known, uh, what's been known previously, um, and shown by us as well as by uh, other groups, is that the Ashkenazi Jews comprise a very distinct uh, genetic group. Um, if you consider the genetics of each individual as a long vector of, uh, of numbers, and then of course it's a vector in very high dimensional space, but you can actually take the vectors of many individuals and project them and put them only in two dimensions, which, which is a standard analysis, finding the principal components in this kind of data. And when you, when you do that, uh, Ashkenazi Jewish samples uh, from various uh, origins in Central or Eastern Europe or cluster together on, on this two-dimensional map, uh, whereas the, uh, where there are different European populations in different colors uh, have their own niche on this map, Middle Eastern populations that were included in this analysis uh, have their uh, separate uh, area on the map, and uh, other Jewish communities uh, that are not Ashkenazi also are distinct genetically. So, um, so let's try to, uh, to tackle these questions one at a time. First, uh, let's try to describe history in a way that would enable us uh, to quantify uh, how severe was the bottleneck in, uh, that created the Ashkenazi Jewish population. How few individuals did this group have uh, when it had been formed? So, in order to do that, uh, in, uh, in a key concept um, is the concept of hidden relatedness, which, uh, which uh, basically says that every two chromosomes in the population are not completely unrelated, even if they're reported as such. Uh, my chromosome 7 and Jessica's um, actually each are a, a, a mosaic of, a, of segments that are, each com that are each coming from an ancestral, a finite ancestral pool of a, chromosomes. And that in turn means that a, at some point along our respective chromosomes, we might have a chance to have uh, the chromosomes come from the same ancestor, uh, the same ancestor. In this case, this, uh, we have this segment that comes from, this, from the yellow ancestor. When this happens, of course, the segment is, inher is inherited intact from that ancestor, and, we, and, and that means that these segments are identical, identical by their descent from that common ancestor, which is something that uh, we detect. 
we are able to detect that using computational methods that uh, our lab and, and other, uh, other groups have developed. Um, when we do that, uh, we're able to, uh, to consider individuals here uh, modeled as nodes in a network and draw links between individuals, between pairs of individuals for which we find relate, uh, connections of hidden relatedness. So um, the, one can think about that as the six degrees of separation rule and, and using that, uh, that analogy, um, we can realize that if we have enough links in the network, we're bound to have everybody connected to everybody. Um, and in fact, there's a mathematical proof for, uh, this, uh, uh, for this kind of, theor uh, of theorems. So when, uh, when we developed those methodologies uh, for finding hidden relatedness, we started applying them to data, uh, our initial expectation had been that we'd very, very quickly be able to connect the entire population in this graph of hidden relatedness. So the first, that actually, literally first data set that we, uh, that we had been working on uh, was a data set by Peter Gregerson uh, of a thousand individuals uh, from New York or a self-report of European, uh, European ancestry. Uh, each each represented by a dot in this, uh, in this cartoon. And when you draw the links of hidden relatedness between every pair in this group, what you see is that, well, first of all, you have lots of links in this map. In fact, you have enough links that should have sufficed to link the entire map. And if links had been randomly placed, the mathematically, mathematical theorems would, guarantee, would practically guarantee that that would have happened. But it, it's enough to glance at this uh, map and realize that the network is completely not random. There's this big cluster of dots that are all connected to one another, um, whereas there are other dots here, other individuals that are not hidden relatives of this group. So we went back to the um, we bent, went back to the files and uh, realized that what we've discovered is uh, just another column that was given to us, uh, which is which one of, of these individuals had been self-reported uh, Jewish of uh, of Eastern European origins. Um, so uh, that was very. Um, uh, very reassuring, but could, uh, could be just an artifact of the specific New York population we have been sampling. Um, so reassuringly, when we compare that to other population of, uh, of Ashkenazi Jews, what we see is essentially the same cluster of individuals who are hidden, remote relatives of one another. Um, the the width of the links in this, uh, in this plot corresponds to the level of, um, of relatedness that are, is inferred between individuals. We know that the closer relatives are, the more segments of the genome they are likely to share between one another. And in fact, the only links you see here are things that in a general population, in an otherwise unrelated population, would have implied individuals are fourth degree cousins or, or closer. It's not to say that the, these individuals are fourth degree cousins or closer, but they share as much as fourth degree cousins would share in, in a completely unrelated in ethnic group. In the fact that you can add more and more samples to this group and still see the same cluster basically means that uh, every two 
uh, Ashkenazi individuals are connected to one another transitively through this cluster with links uh, of a very long shared segments. Shared segments that are uh, otherwise seen um, between very close relatives. So we sought to quantify this effect. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so uh, one, what, sorry, one more, much more personal aspect of this uh, is a, 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 is provided here courtesy of a personal genetics company 23 and, and me um, and what we see here is the comparison of uh, my genotype and uh, the better professor pair um, where we share two chromosome uh, two segments that are here in blue on chromosome 4 and one a segment on chromosome 16, um, totaling uh, about uh, 20 million uh, nucleotides of our genomes. Um, and this is, of course, courtesy of the uh, implementation uh, of this detection of hidden relatedness uh, by uh, Brenna Hen, who is supposed to be here in the audience, um, and colleagues uh, from her work at the uh, 23 Me. Um, so, um, after seeing that this, uh, both anecdotally as well as in several across several courts, the ones I showed here and, and several others that we got access to through collaborations to uh, collaborations with individuals interested in uh, Ashkenazi genetics uh, around New York City, um, we tried to be much more quantitative about this. Uh, and while I don't intend to go through the uh, explicit, uh, explicit math here, uh, let me perhaps provide you with the intuition, which is that uh, if we are considering siblings, well, siblings share very long chunks of their, uh, the, the, their chromosomes with one another. If you then consider cousins, they, sh they share slightly shorter segments. And the farther apart are the two remote relatives, uh, the shorter the segments that they share are. Um, well, this is a qualitative statement. This is a very exact probabilistic distribution that we can write down that describes the length of the segment that we expect every pair of remote relatives to share with one another. Um, now, so, so that means that if we know how far apart are the, the two individuals, when did their common ancestor live, we know everything. That time to the most recent common ancestor actually depends on demography. If you think about that, in this cartoon, every generation of the population is represented by a row of these cartoon characters. Um, and we have a population of a constant size. Uh, today, previous generation, the grandparents' generations, and the generations before. Um, and in such a population, uh, you can trace back lineages of pairs of individuals till you find their common ancestor. Now, in a large population, it would take a long time for these pairs of lineages to actually coalesce and find the common ancestor. In a smaller population, you can imagine that everybody is much more related to everybody. It would take much shorter time for these pairs of lineages to meet up. And again, this is all very qualitative, but the, the exact formulation for this theory of coalescence is very well, very well developed. Uh, all it meant is that we could take this uh, and the analysis of the length of shared segments between individuals that, put, uh, that, are, that are siblings, cousins, and so forth, put them together uh, and predict, based on demography, how the shared segments in a cohort, in a cohort are supposed to look like. 
Um, the, it, since we have data about the shared segment, this in turn gives us a way to evaluate models for demography. If we have a particular candidate model, we can, uh, we can predict the distribution of shared segments. If it does not fit the data, we need to fit, we need to change the model and revise our hypothesis. So doing that very systematically, the, uh, the model that we came up with, um, the model that, this, that is the best fit for the data we had um, across multiple, again, across multiple uh, Ashkenazi cohorts, is a model where, uh, this is the present here, uh, the y-axis is times and years ago, where the, uh, the current population size is very large, it's in the millions. We rarely see individuals in our data that have very long segments that are shared between them. But the segments that, uh, uh, that, we're, uh, that we do see point out that many lineages actually meet up at a particular point in time, not too far ago, uh, ago in time. So about 30 generations ago or 800 years ago uh, is the uh, optimal model that we would, uh, were able to come up with. Now, the extent of the sharing of segments suggests a very small population size at that, uh, at that bottleneck time. Specifically, uh, the, uh, uh, the data is consistent with only 300 individuals that had started this, uh, this population. Or um, and, and after, and, and after a period when the population had been much larger. So if lineages do not meet up at this point, then it typically takes them a while to, uh, to meet up because the population before the bottleneck it seems to have been much larger. Now before the bottleneck, uh, we see what people see when they analyze any post-agricultural community, which is uh, that uh, over, the, over several hundreds of generations, the population had been growing, and the data is consistent with that. The data is showing that signal, uh, but that is not, uh, not very unique. That's just a slow growth of the population. What is, uh, what is very unique is the uh, very rapid growth of the population from a small number of individuals uh, to millions today. Um, it's worthwhile pointing out that uh, the, this number of hundreds of individuals is what population geneticists call an effective population size, uh, which means uh, that instead of 300 individuals at a bottleneck that's, uh, that's one point in time, one generation, you can consider 3,000 individuals over 10 generations. Uh, you cannot though play this trick uh, for too long because the data shows that lineages meet up at a very distinct point in time so, uh, rather than uh, along a prolonged, a prolonged period. So, um, so that, uh, that gives us a sense of the, uh, of the population size at the at or the effective population size at medieval times, but it also has a, a very practical meaning. Because in this day and age, a few hundreds of individuals is something that's very practical to tackle and to get DNA, a DNA sequence from. Um, so we only need a, needed a time machine to go back into the, the medieval times and to grab those, uh, those founder individuals and, and, and sequence them. Um, instead of doing that, we chose the, uh, the next ben best thing and figure out a different way to, uh, to use this very small bottleneck. Instead of sequencing the individuals at the bottleneck, we can get data from individuals, uh, individuals living today from this population, individuals 
who might rep be representative of the variation at the bottom. So um, the rationale is that uh, if we have a, a large courts, court of individuals where we have uh, we've looked at genetic markers called SNP, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and provided genotype uh, observations for them throughout, we can actually identify the shared segment between every pair of individuals. So we can identify that this green segment is shared across uh, this individual, this one, and these two. The yellow segment is shared between this individuals and these three, and so, uh, so forth for the red segment as well. This, in turn, allows us to sequence only this single individual and get for free the genetic content of all the segments that this individual is sharing with the other members of the cohorts. So we are able to impute the content of the, uh, of the other DNA sequences, the other genomes, uh, based on sequencing only, uh, only one of them. The, uh, we teamed up with, uh, and here are the dreidels, um, we teamed up with the, uh, with a group of individual, a group of investigators that we had already been collaborating with because they were all interested in different aspects of Jewish genetics and uh, each of them studying their own, uh, their own disease in um, Ashkenazi Jewish cohorts. And we formed the Ashkenazi Genome Consortium uh, in order to, uh, to actually do exactly this. So we, uh, we designed a study where we sequenced, we obtained the DNA sequence of a significant collection of 108 um, unrelated individuals that are all uh, healthy, uh, are, are all in their 60s. Uh, so the, uh, they should be good controls for uh, any kind of uh, disease that uh, other investigators are studying. Um, we validated for all, uh, for all of them that uh, the, uh, their ancestry is Ashkenazi Jewish by the principal component analysis that I mentioned previously and, and obtained a very high coverage in DNA sequencing data for the whole for their their whole genomes. Um, for sequencing in fish and others, uh, this uh, this was a 50-fold sequencing effort, 50x, uh, using complete genomics technology. The um, in order to um, in order to analyze this data, we compare that to um, to um, a group of European individuals, Flemish individuals, uh, that uh, had been sequenced using exactly the same technology, exactly the same, uh, ver the same uh, analysis pipelines. Uh, so we were able to, uh, to observe what's similar and what's different in between the obtained sequences. Um, in, and let me just point out that well, well, so the 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 data um, uh, the data is actually uh, uh, been, been submitted to public archives, so it uh, would be available for public access upon publication. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, all our collaborators are now pursuing studies of their of their respective. Uh, diseases of interest uh, using this information about the uh, Ashkenazi variation in controls. Um, so what, ha what, what do we see when we, uh, when we compare um, Ashkenazi variation um, versus uh, Flemish or European variation? Um, so when you count the, just the total tally, of single nucleotide polymorphism markers, all SNPs that we see in the genome, uh, the, uh, each of the 
Ashkenazi samples has a bit more in a bit more genetic variation, a bit more variance in than the European samples. And if you ask whether the individuals are carrying only one copy of that, uh, of that variant, are they heterozygous for that variant, uh, or are they homozygous to the, uh, to the, um, uh, the allele that, uh, that is observed, um, we see slight excess in Ashkenazi genomes compared to Flemish ones. Uh, the, the straightforward interpretation of seeing uh, more differences between even the two copies of the same, uh, uh, copies of this genome in the same individual, so indiv individuals are more heterozygous in the Ashkenazi group, um, this tip, uh, the standard interpretation of that is that uh, the genomes are, um, uh, are more, have a more ancient component of, uh, of ancestry, leading them to be a bit more different um, on average. The, um, um, when you consider not all variants, but only genetic variants that have not been seen before the study, uh, we see a somewhat more pronounced uh, difference uh, where Ashkenazi Jews have 14% uh, uh, more in new variants compared to uh, European, uh, European genomes. And the reason for that is much more mundane. It's just the, the fact that the databases of human genetic variation at the time had been under, uh, underrepresenting variants in, uh, that we see in Ashkenazi samples, whereas many of the first genomes, the genome sequences that had been obtained, had been from European origin individuals. <laughs> when uh, um, uh, central analysis uh, uh, of uh, populations relies on uh, looking at each allele and asking how frequently do we observe it uh, in the population. So when we consider the minor allele count, how many times we see um, uh, that, uh, that allele, and this is in a group of only uh, 25 Europeans versus 25 uh, Ashkenazi samples in order to compare apples to apples. Um, we, we can count what fraction of the variants are observed only once in the sample, twice in the sample, three times, and so on. And, uh, and compare uh, the Ashkenazi sample to the Flemish one and both to the uh, theoretical prediction from a model, uh, uh, a model based on standard assumptions of the literature of a constant population size. Uh, what we see is that both populations have a, an excess of, a, of these rare variants compared to this uh, model, which is no surprise. As I mentioned earlier, a, all post-agricultural communities, uh, on, on post-agricultural populations have been expanding. Therefore, it's, uh, it's no surprise that the, uh, um, that, uh, the, uh, they reject a uh, model of a constant size population. Um, in, when you consider the differences between populations, well, you see, uh, uh, you see that there's a, a slight excess of these uh, alleles that are observed more than once in, uh, in, uh, in Ash the Ashkenazi group, uh, and that would correspond to these segments that are identical by descent, and therefore you see variants twice in the, uh, in the population. Now, when you consider the joint probability distribution, the, the frequency of each allele in both the Flemish sample as well as the Ashkenazi sample, um, you can uh, 
we can plot each allele once on this heat map. And so most of the alleles end up here in this very hot part of this plot. Most of the variants that are observed are rare. Um, and the picture is, the picture is quite, uh, quite symmetric um, and somewhat concentrated along the, uh, along the diagonal, showing that there is significant correlation between uh, what alleles, what variants are common in one population versus the other. Um, but when you compare that to what one would have expected by chance, uh, with a population that is essentially one, uh, you observe that the, uh, the, in the populations are distinct uh, and the, the frequency of their alleles are more differentiated than what would have been expected from a single panmectic population. Um, uh, that, in turn, suggests that there must have been some gene flow between the, uh, these groups, uh, though the populations uh, must have had distinct histories. So uh, we, tr we tried to put it all, uh, uh, so, sorry, uh, one more piece of, sorry, one more piece of evidence uh, has to do with variants that we see in one population versus another. Uh, when we consider the same analysis of how many times we see, do we see each allele in, uh, in each population, uh, we observed that uh, this analysis of alleles that are only, um, only Ashkenazi versus only Flemish is not symmetric. Specifically, alleles that are, uh, that are Flemish specific are just rare. So you might not have seen them in the set of sample, the set of Ashkenazi samples just because they're rare. If you would have sampled more, we would have seen them. Whereas for, a, for the Ashkenazi group, we actually see a Ashkenazi specific alleles that are, that are more common in, that a, suggest a non-European component in their, a, in their ancestry. Trying to put this uh, all together and build uh, uh, an inferred model, uh, uh, we went through a, a long process of uh, computational analysis and inference uh, the, uh, that converged to, to a particular model. So uh, let's start building this model one piece at a time, and let's start with the European samples, the Flemish samples. So what we see for the Flemish samples is consistent with uh, what many others have seen previously when analyzing the uh, genetics in Europe, uh, which is a, a history of two population bottleneck, bottlenecks. A population today had been, uh, had been growing, but uh, had been uh, very small at one period in the past, and also uh, had been a relatively small at a previous period in the past. And these correspond, uh, the, the first such population bottleneck corresponds to the out of Africa uh, exodus. Uh, all humans essentially originate from, uh, from, uh, from Africa. And the, in populations out of Africa, we all see uh, the, uh, that a, a smaller group of humans actually left Africa uh, and, and colonized the rest of the world. Um, the second population bottleneck is the population bottleneck into Europe. So uh, the, uh, the population in between is in transit uh, through, the, uh, through the Middle East or Levant. Um, where do Ashkenazi Jews fit in this picture? So um, Ashkenazi Jews show very strong signals of being an admixed population, so having two sources of ancestry. Uh, one is c consistent with essentially being European, um, and the other is consistent with that intermediate population, that Middle Eastern or, or Levant population. When you try to quantify uh, the 
the fraction of ancestry that's European versus, uh, versus Middle Eastern, you get about 55 to 45% uh, ancestry average uh, across, uh, across our samples. Now, uh, one nice thing about this analysis and this, uh, this having ancestors both from within Europe, so through the into Europe transition, as well as ancestry that's outside Europe, is that we can compare within a single sample in a very controlled system uh, the, uh, the two parts of the genome and therefore analyze and timestamp this event of, uh, of colonizing Europe. Um, the timestamp that, uh, that we can put on it is between 10,000 and uh, 20,000 uh, years ago, uh, which, which is very significant because this event is after the, um, and, um, the last glacial maximum. So uh, the, uh, and, and specifically, these migrants into Europe are not the first ones to have settled into Europe. We know that Europe had been settled uh, more than 40,000 uh, years ago by hunter-gatherers, uh, but what this suggests is that there is significant inflow of gen influx of genetic variation into Europe uh, after that initial, uh, initial colonization. Um, last but not least, uh, the timestamp uh, for this uh, admixture uh, component is in the, uh, in the last few thousand uh, years that might correspond to, uh, to, the, uh, to the Jewish diaspora. Now, one comment is that uh, these evaluations uh, may seem to be uh, relatively vague with a two-fold uh, uh, confidence interval. Actually, when uh, redoing, when rerunning the analysis again and again uh, in methods that uh, evaluate robustness of the analysis, the confidence intervals for the computation are very, very small. The uncertainty uh, draws upon a, an, a very fundamental uncertainty in the field, which is how, uh, how fast uh, do humans suffer mutations. Uh, so, uh, I've chosen to be very conservative here and, uh, and present you with the, uh, with the entire range of uh, available timelines. Whenever that kind of conflict in the literature is going to be resolved, probably experimentally, these numbers would, uh, are likely to stabilize at a much narrower range. So, um, so this provides some, uh, some information or some data points regarding the, uh, the genetic identity or origins of Ashkenazi Jews. Uh, but I still owe you an answer regarding how to, to actually use this data. How, what kind of practical value can we provide to genetic investigation uh, as well as personalized medicine? So, um, recall that uh, our hope had been to represent the variation in, uh, in the bottleneck so that we can infer or impute uh, genetic information from one sequence sample into uh, many others. The value of such, uh, of such an endeavor um, it can be measured by the utility, so what fraction of the popul population as a whole can we, uh, can we actually impute based on sequencing one, two, 100, 200 samples in, in terms of investment. So this is, uh, this is a utility versus investment um, trade-off. And um, when, depending on what lengths of segments uh, we're using, a, in the Ashkenazi group, it, we're getting a, a 60 to 70% of the 
population genome um, inferred if we're using segments, uh, segments that are three centimogons in length, so about three million DNA letters and clotides in length. Um, whereas in a European population, we, uh, we get almost nothing from, uh, from, the, uh, from, say, the first hundred samples. Um, uh, what's more, it, it's important to point out that uh, we're getting a lot of bank for our buck uh, in this part of the curve, a lot of return on investment, but the curve really plateaus uh, at this point. So um, it, um, it may not be worthwhile to spend much more and sequence, uh, say, a, a thousand individuals. This, uh, this really corresponds, with to, it corresponds to the uh, a limited size of the bottleneck population where the first samples you sequence give you new information about the bottleneck population, whereas uh, at some point there is a phase transition and you keep sequencing information from the same ancestors again and again. So that's, uh, so that, that's a very good source of information. How can we use that? And, um, and specifically, uh, how can we use that when you think about, um, about your personalized, personal genome as your uh, genetic thread of destiny uh, that uh, you can go to your physician and get uh, an interpretation of, uh, which is some, some perhaps idealized perception of, uh, of personalized genetics that uh, people might have. So we're actually both near and far from that vision. Uh, one challenge is the amount of noise in the data. Uh, when you actually use industry standard in sequencing and obtain a personal genome, uh, you get lots of variants but you, that are really there, but you also get lots of false positively detected variants, variants that are reported but are not really their errors in the data. And of course, you wouldn't want to go to your doctor and get uh, 10,000 or 40,000 false reasons to be worried about. Um, but this is technology, and technology is improving rapidly, so you can, uh, you can potentially hope for, how am I doing time? Um, the um, the uh, technology is improving rapidly. You can hope or expect uh, for problems to be resolved in the, uh, in the future, but that's uh, that's uh, um, and, and and in fact, experience, even experience is is very very helpful. Uh, it turns out that the in the data that we started with. Uh, we saw, uh, uh, we saw um, more than uh, 120,000 variants that we haven't seen before in each individual. Uh, but uh, when we learned from our experience and improved our quality control based on that, uh, we're able to, uh, to uh, eliminate a significant fraction of them um, in terms of in total variants that are new and have not been seen before. Uh, if you add to that some information about which variants actually uh, have some, uh, might have some function, uh, you reduce the number from uh, uh, around 600 to less than 400 um, mutations per or potential mutations per individual, uh, which, is, uh, which is already getting uh, into something more, uh, more relevant practically. But technology, is, uh, technology may be the least uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the sources of problems that we might need to handle because uh, in each and every one of us, we would see uh, typically tens of thousands of variants that are truly there. We truly do carry them. 
but are just not in the database, have not been reported because nobody had sequenced our family members or, uh, or uh, even remote family members in order to discover them. So uh, and there, are, um, there are tens of thousands of such inherited novel variants are really there um, and, and those are very hard to interpret. Those are variants of unknown significance as they're usually termed by the literature. Uh, so how, to what extent uh, can, the, uh, can this catalog of Ashkenazi genetic variation help in this, re in this regard? So uh, when you consider all, uh, in, uh, all variants that are new in each single uh, Ashkenazi individual, uh, you get about uh, 36, 37 thousands that are new, out of which uh, about 150 uh, are, uh, are functional. Um, if you try to filter those using the European genomes, the Flemish genomes, uh, you don't get much out of that. Uh, only a few variants uh, get eliminated from the reasons to be concerned. So this is based on 26 uh, Flemish genomes. What happens if we uh, instead filter those lists based on 26 in genomes from the same population, 26 Ashkenazi uh, genomes? Well, uh, here now we already see a significant drop in the number of biological false a false positive biological uh, inherited novel variants per genome that had never been seen before. And if we use the full power of the panel that we sequenced, all 128 samples, uh, we uh, were able to reduce this uh, number of variants even further. And the number of novel variants that are functional uh, uh, gets down to the two digit range, something that's uh, it's already much more reasonable to, uh, to be handled. So, um, and ideally, if you, if you really had a, full, a good representation of a population in a, a population 30 generations ago, you might be able to reduce this uh, number by full order of magnitude um, using such data. So, just to uh, wrap up, uh, we sequenced 128 uh, Ashkenazi Jewish healthy individuals and were able to show how to rely on this kind of data for personalized genomics. Uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, providing information regarding, uh, regarding uh, history, um, we were able to show that the Ashkenazi population had experienced a, a very rapid growth after a relatively recent population bottleneck. Uh, the population before the bottleneck uh, is actually an admixed population with both European as well as a Middle Eastern ancestry. This in turn allows us to provide information regarding the, um, the migration of, in, of humans into Europe and timestamp that to between 10,000 and, uh, and 20,000 years ago. Um, I want to thank the amazing collaborators that we uh, had uh, and still have in the Ashkenazi Genome Cons uh, Consortium. And specifically, uh, I want to highlight uh, Todd Lentz from, uh, from, uh, uh, from the Long Island Jewish Medical Center would have been a, a, a key participant here, um, as well as collaborators at uh, Albert Einstein, Columbia Med School, Sloan Kettering, Sinai, uh, Yale with Israel, and, and the Hebrew University. Um, and I, I'd like to thank the, our funders, the collaborators in Belgium, uh, and also, most of all, uh, Shai Karmi, the, uh, the postdoc who had been conducting uh, almost all of these analysis here with piles and piles of three terabyte drives that uh, had harbored the data that we got from, uh, from the sequencers. Thank you.